Nothing on today's show should be seen as an endorsement or investment advice. If you ask the question, how much uh, does it cost to mine a single Bitcoin at current difficulty compared to how much does it cost to buy? If you have the -the state-of-the-art hardware available at no cost and the best possible electricity prices, uh, you can probably mine um, one Bitcoin for about $60. Hello, welcome to episode 25 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. I'm not a Bitcoin, blockchain, or investing expert. I just interview people I think are interesting in the Bitcoin space. If I were to meet Marco Strang on the street, I'd never guess he directly controls perhaps the largest amount of hashing power in the world. Marco is the CEO and co-founder of Genesis Mining, a company that mines for profit and also offers cloud mining. I met Marco back at the State of Digital Money Conference in Los Angeles earlier this year as he was one of the speakers. I'll admit, I've always been skeptical about cloud mining. At worst, you're simply putting your money into a Ponzi scheme. And at best, you have to trust that even a legit company doesn't get hacked, go broke, or have another issue that can beset any company. Yet Marco was able to restore my trust that there are legitimate companies providing cloud mining services. There's still always the unknown variables of future price and future difficulty, which can render a net loss to even the best laid cloud mining plans. Stepping back from profitability concerns, cloud mining services enable smaller players to help secure the network. So I think anyone who supports the security of Bitcoin can see the benefit of legitimate cloud mining services. They simply reduce the friction for eager miners to contribute hash power to the network. Please visit the show notes page for links to topics we discussed. Then for this episode, you'll find a video of Marco presenting at the State of Digital Money Conference. Here's Marco. Hey, Rob. Hello. Hey, Marco. Everything good? Yeah, everything brilliant on my side. It sounds like you are super busy. What kind of things does one of the biggest cloud mining companies, what are the issues you're dealing with, say, today right now? Yeah, hello, uh, Rob, first of all, and thanks uh, for having me in your show. Um well, there is a lot of things. I mean, I think the mining in general is uh, the fastest market that you can imagine uh, since every day is money, right? Every day that you don't mine, you lose opportunity. And um, that way, everything is really rushy. Uh, it's, it's very quick. You know, people don't sleep much. We're all working very hard. And uh, you can imagine, I mean... Uh, also, our uh, market participants, uh, they are not too much different. So you're battling each other who works harder. And uh, But it's, it's fun, you know. It's not um, something that stresses you. It's, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, you wake up in the morning and really uh, you are excited about the day what will come. Wow. Because there is also so much action and so much variety of things. Of course, uh, every day you're looking at the prices. Uh, Not that we are uh, fearing if it goes a bit down. I mean, we're all getting used to this. Um, But still, uh, of course, the the Bitcoin price also has some effect. But that's it has effect for for everybody probably in the Bitcoin world. Although we are long-term believers and... Nobody's bothering about a short drop or if it's getting pumped or uh, for a short time uh, during the day. But um, still, uh, it's, it's, it's on our monitoring screen here in the office and uh, so that everybody has, uh, has a direct view on, on the price and also on the difficulty. What was your background before you got interested in Bitcoin? Um, my background, I came from uh, academia. I'm a mathematician and uh, I was actually in the middle of some uh, research uh, while I actually heard about uh, Bitcoin. And uh, it started as a kind of side project that got me very interested and yeah, it turned out to, to change my life completely. When was this? That was uh, in around 2011. Uh, that was the time where I first um, read about Bitcoin and, uh, and started some projects and, uh, and got more involved. I mean, the community by that time was, was not really big. Um, but for me, it was, uh, yeah, it was already exciting because I also saw the potential and, um, it's, it's really cool to see the guys from, from this early day, um, and how they are mostly still, uh, now more, um, involved in, in Bitcoin, so they, they are one of the main uh, people in the economy. Um, Anyone in particular you're thinking of? 
The thing is, Rob, that uh, you know a lot of uh, people in Bitcoin they t take also uh, anonymity uh, as a high priority, especially the ones that uh, really came from not from the monetary uh, aspect, but from an ideal uh, perspective, or uh, came from the uh, from the uh, co ideal components that Bitcoin brought. Um, and of course, privacy is one big thing, and um, some of them are. Of course, um, major holders of Bitcoin, I think if someone was uh, in uh, already by that early time, it didn't uh, take much for you to be in a financially favorable position uh, if you held uh, Bitcoin uh, from that time till now. And uh, some of them are keeping themselves in the back, um, but uh, controlling and pushing um, Bitcoin innovation. They don't, don't probably want to be named too too loud uh, because they take privacy uh, as a major. Um, uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna guess you started mining pretty quickly when you got into it. Is that is that correct? Yes, I started quickly. Uh, however, it took me a while. Um, I mean, Genesis Mining was found. That was the big, uh, the the real major project in our uh, in our entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, live in Bitcoin, uh, and that started by the end of 2013. So r relatively late um, compared to when we when we got in. You weren't mining personally back in 2011. Yeah, I had uh, I had some smaller machines running. By that time, I didn't scale it up uh, that quickly. The real large uh, scale mining just started then with Genesis Mining at the end of 2013. I, I also, when I speak at some conferences, I uh, show uh, pictures of my first uh, yeah, home miner that was a, a GPU rig um, that was in a small box. And uh, uh, that's very interesting, uh, interesting to see for, for a lot of people. It's not, uh, not common at, at all at the moment, of course, because the ASICs are, are there since a long time and uh, it has changed. How did you decide to try to go for it big with Genesis Mining? That seems like a really huge step to make. Well, by the time we started in really large-scale mining, um, we that was the time, end of 2013, October, November, when the price went from $100 to $1,000. Sure. Um, that was a big, of course, big attention for Bitcoin, uh, big growth uh, from the user numbers and a lot of hype as well. And... Um, the the actual uh, interesting point was also that altcoins, uh, yeah, got significant value increase. Litecoin got uh, thirty times their the value uh, in December. Yeah, I have some Litecoin. I was pretty happy. <laughs> 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 yeah. So yeah, that that was a very exciting time, and we directly uh, used the opportunities and. Uh, and 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 got a, a real large scale operation done in the Eastern uh, Europe, um, and from then on we expanded further, uh, got some deals with the manufacturers, um, mainly in China. By that time, we got a, far, a second farm up in China, directly next to the manufacturer. Brilliant, brilliant position for us. Of course, we got the chips directly for out of the uh, factory and out of the foundries, um, and deployed them at our farm and uh, provided the hash power. And actually, why, when we started, we didn't even have too much in mind making this kind of business as we are, as we are doing now with Genesis. Um, we actually wanted for ourselves to start a big uh, mining operation because we just saw the potential and saw how much uh, opportunity is in there. And uh, then actually afterwards, as we showed some pictures to friends and told them about it, it, it was huge uh, response and feedback. And they all said, well, Marco, please, I want to, I really want to uh, join that. How can I, what, what can I do? And uh, of course we said then, uh, well, um, we can increase our capacity and uh, of course provide the service for you as well. And that led uh, into the direction of the business uh, model where we are now. We have still a, a large farm for ourselves, but if users want to join us, we are providing the service. And uh, I think we have provided uh, the cloud mining service uh, or hosted mining or whatever you want to call it. And we have um, done very decently and very well uh, over the time and are now the market leader. The biggest thing I've always wondered is how, as a big mining company, you deal with, you know, the price is 800 1000 you guys are getting started, ramping up, and then suddenly the price tanks. 
How do you handle that? What happens to a big mining operation when that happens? We have done a lot of research before um, when we uh, spoke to the electricity providers and uh, our facilities when we decided where we're going to deploy our large operations. And um, we know, knew exactly why we're doing that because we knew for a miner it is the most important thing uh, to be the most efficient player. If you are the most efficient player, meaning to have the best electricity rates and the highest efficiency from the hardware side, um, you are in a very favorable position because you can continue to mine while others that are not so efficient are in the reds and have to turn off their machines. And when they turn off their machines, that means that they're dropping out and you get a higher share of the mined bitcoins, a higher share of the hash power, and that increases your profit again. So, And that, of course doesn't depend on the price, right? Because if the price is dropping down and you are the, the most efficient miner, that means there will be a kind of uh, buffered effect for your profit because uh, as lower the price goes and as lower the profitability is going, the more other miners have to turn down their machines. And uh, that means the lower the hash power will get and uh, therefore the higher your profit again. So. This, this is always to, to consider when you are modeling uh, mining scenarios. And I think uh, there is nothing more concrete to be seen uh, as just looking at the home miners now. I mean, the time for the home miners is mostly over. There are still some, some people that want to support the network, which I think is very honorable, and some hobbyists. But uh, nobody is plugging in a miner at home in the U.S., for example, in most of the U.S. regions. Uh, to make a profit, right? They just cannot compete with, with the large-scale operations like, like we or other big players in the market have, just from the electricity prices. So you mentioned uh, a few locations. I'd always just heard about your Iceland location. So how many locations do you have? Oh, we have more, of course. Uh, Iceland is certainly a big uh, location. We have a big site there. But besides that, we are also in America. We're doing something um, in Canada. So how do you do it in America with the electricity prices? Where, where... I cannot give too much detail. It's very sensitive, uh, everything. Um, but uh, not all of America, of course, is uh, having a higher price. So there are, you know, there are some opportunities. If you have a significant size, you can have a good negotiation power and you can figure out some deals that uh, work very well. Only in some areas and uh, also America is by far our smallest operation, so it's not so attractive. But, uh, you, you know, we also decide for this because of diversification. We distribute amongst other um, jurisdictions and um, yeah. Things come to my mind, but what are the, the areas you're thinking diversification is important for by being located several places? Well, you know, I mean, this is all very unlikely, but for example, one country just decides Bitcoin mining is bad for whatever reason, and they should try to shut down operations. Um, if we are diversified and we have other mines as well and on other, uh, in other areas, uh, we are not, not directly hit so much if we would have uh, all the, our capacities in this particular region, right? So this is just one part. I mean, we are very, very selective when it comes to um, uh, picking us a, a location for mining. Uh, we are checking the political stability. We are checking a lot of facts, security, and so on. Um, but we, we want to do the best. So diversification even for the really carefully selected places, uh, also is important for us. I know, you know, there are a lot of things you don't want to talk about just to, I guess, keep a competitive advantage. But can you tell me in any rough terms how big Genesis Mining is? Well, what I can say is that um, I think it's not a secret uh, so far that, or actually maybe it is, uh, for the people that are involved in mining, it's not, but uh, more, more deeply involved in mining, it's not. But uh, I would say about 75% of the hash power uh, is really based coming from individual large-scale mining facilities that are yeah, mostly kept secret, uh, actually all kept secret. Um, and it's single large-scale and massive facilities. And the number of these uh, mining uh, facilities are, I think you can count them in two hands. And 
we have some, uh, yeah, clearly some of them uh, can, can be assigned to us. <laughs> okay, so some of the 10 or less large mining facilities are yours. Yeah. If you're looking at the hash power distribution, you will not see a specific Genesis mining field. That's because we um, prefer to, to use our partnering pools. Some pools are stronger in some, uh, some regions, and uh, we always pick the ones that is best for the given uh, mining site because of the, geo, uh, of the location uh, geographically. We want to be as transparent as possible, and I think we have proven a lot of transparency. Uh, giving the exact amount, I think, is, is, is not appropriate because we, we lose some competitive uh, advantage. Um, Just so I have a sense yeah. of scale, though, can you tell me 100,000, 10,000, 1,000? I mean, what, what is the closest number rounding? <laughs> can you give me that much or no? You mean number of miners? Yeah. I'm just trying to get a picture uh, well, in my head of what it looks like if we were to look at all your, you know, racks stacked up. But that's okay if 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 you don't want to. Yeah, it's it's no. thousands. It's Th thousands. thousands. Okay. So it's, it's yeah. Um, Not hundreds of uh, thousands. I mean, it all depends on what what kind of uh, you can have one hundreds of thousands of uh, old, really uh, one of the first minor generations, and then you still have a very small amount of hash power uh, totally. So it's not too much of a of an indication how much mining machines they have. Um, it was just for a mental picture, but I'll, I'll ask you then: um, like, how long do you keep a typical mining unit running, basically? Since we have this low electricity rate. We never were forced to, to, to build down some um, machines, which is, is great for all customers of us. And uh, I mean now specifically for Shah, uh, which is great for the customers and uh, is also good for us. We, we don't like to, to, to get miners out. Uh, of course, at some point, um, yeah, some really old machines uh, might be exchanged, but uh, so far, no need to, for that because we we have so good electricity prices that we were not forced to do so. Wow, that's interesting. I, I just assumed that uh, year, two-year-old units, well, I guess you haven't been around two years yet, but um, do you buy all kinds of different types of equipment or are there specific manufacturers you tend to use? Yeah, the good thing is that we always want to get the best for our clients and that means that we always, we are getting the best deal for them. And um who that lately will be is up to the market, right? And we are not binded or uh, restricted in any way. We are always open for getting just the best deal. And if there is a new manufacturer coming with the whatever new product that is outperforming the rest, we're open for that, right? Which is good. It's, it's perfect. So when I heard you speak in Los Angeles in April uh, at the State of Digital Money, you seemed a, a little optimistic about uh, New York's bit license, but I saw you ended up uh, pulling out of New York. Uh, what in the bit license made you get out of New York? The reason for our move to, to go out of New York was mainly because uh, the uncertainty of how to go forward and also because we and that is actually the most important point that was the most important point because we wanted to set a sign that as it is currently phrased the bit license is not really favorable and gives a lot of power to to bigger companies that uh, might be able to to get the the legal setup or the the license and just dominate because of the because they have the the license and not because they are better right best is always the one that offers the best service should win or uh, should grow and not the one that might have the, the right context or might have the right money or the right influence in order to just be in the market and can separate uh, them uh, himself out from the competitors just because he has the 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 license for it so you were making a statement more than trying to stay compliant. Is that correct? It's both. Uh, we, of course, we want to stay compliant, um, but we also wanted to make a statement. That's correct. And I think that also other major Bitcoin companies had the same intention. And I think um, we have achieved uh, that in a way where it was really popular. I read a lot in the mainstream um, articles in the news um, CNBC, Business Insider, they, they all talked about it and uh, wrote articles that there's really some resistance from the successful Bitcoin businesses uh, against the bit license. And I think it's important that this is heard 
and that uh, people see and, uh, and 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 really recognize that. Great. Well, I think it's commendable to to make a statement. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of questions because I know you're pressed for time and get to a big one. I, as as one of the really big miners, I'm really curious how you feel about the block size debate and how you feel about Bitcoin XT. Yeah, the block size debate, I think, is a critical point that everybody involved in Bitcoin should have an opinion on. I think it's something that is really pressing more and more um, because... Uh, we are running into this scenario where uh, we are reaching really the limit. And um, I mean, if if you follow it, there's uh, a lot of discussion how it will go forward. And uh, I hope and I'm optimistic that uh, consensus will be found amongst the core developers and amongst the miners and that we can all go in one direction at some point. So you're going to reserve a judgment on which way you're going and ho just hope things get straightened out without a need to fork? Well, no, no, no. I have my clear opinion. Um, uh -huh. I agree with uh, most of our users. I mean, we have made a big poll mm -hmm. that had a significant size. I mean, we, we uh, asked all of our mo more than uh, 60,000 customers so far. Did you say six or 60,000? 60,000 and 60,000 miners, right? So it's a representative sample. And we asked them and we also told them really the, the pros and cons uh, in a neutral way, not wanting to influence them. And um, they, I think it was about 86% was uh, for a blockchain increase and the rest was uh, for uh, let, let it stay where it is or uh, even drop it further. That is, I think, a, a, a clear one. And uh, I, I think I'm, I'm more even concrete that I think increase is the solution. And of course, I mean, now the, the current debate is, of course, how will it be increased? Is it uh, BIPs 101 or uh, 102? Or There are several solutions, obviously. And uh, I think um, the best would be that we are temporarily increasing it now and then use the time uh, f uh, before it comes to the next uh, limit uh, in order to really develop a sustainable solution that can uh, go via side chains or lightning network uh, or other promising uh, protocols or other promising uh, ways and therefore uh, find a really good solution that where everybody is happy with. Is there a specific block size you'd like to see? Is there something specifically that you think makes sense for, say, the coming year? I think it's just important to increase it in a way that uh, we it, it gives enough time for developing sustainable solutions. Maybe it's a complete other solution, but uh, sidechains and uh, Lightning Network has some really cool features that make totally sense. And where you can, for example, increase the Bitcoin network by not running into the troubles that uh, you would run into when you are increasing block size uh, further and further, um, because that has some disadvantages, like it's getting more and more expensive and uh, for running a node and, uh, and, and things like that. I don't know how much you, you are uh, familiar with uh, side chains, but, you know, there are just solutions that... For example, do um, microtransactions just on a side chain uh, and just use Bitcoin, the, the blockchain, as a settlement. And that way you can solve it in a really elegant way. There will be maybe better ones. We never know. But fact is, uh, there needs to be a solution now because uh, the, we are approaching the limit of, uh, for the four transactions per, per second. And uh, by that time, we should increase it uh, to give us just more time to develop a sustainable solution where we all agree on. And when we have the sustainable solution, uh, we can then go forward. Okay, so it sounds like you really aren't in favor of Bitcoin XT, just we need to get the block size bigger. Is that correct? Or um, I mean, Bitcoin XT is one of a lot of uh, others uh, alternatives. But I think what Gavin uh, did, he had the incentive to to push it you know to so bring it really to to the people's mind and tell them hey guys something needs to happen and uh i think he he did a really good job because i had sometimes the feeling because this discussion is quite long now uh, really uh, ongoing um it was never that popular as it is now of course because it's really pressing but two years now this topic is there but always 
uh, it, it was said, well, we can wait or we don't need to address it now. And Gavin now gave the incentive, please, guys, we need to discuss. We are doing the Bitcoin XT now. Um, I think it's it's good that, that he did this move and took the, the lead in that sense. Do, do I get you're saying you support the move as it kind of forces the hand of the core developers to, to really come to consensus? Yes, I really respect Gavin in, a, in this way that he clearly pushed the guys or pushed the people to really move and, and do something now. And I think in a, even in a decentralized infrastructure, it's important that you have some people that give the impulse and do some actions and be a leader in a way. And um, I, th I think he did a good, good job by that. Today's magic word is Iceland. I C E L A N D. Use the magic word and claim your share of this week's listener reward of LTB coin on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. You have one week from this episode's release to claim this magic word. When I heard you speak before, you mentioned that you would sometimes give tours of your, I think, your facility in Iceland, you had mentioned. Uh -huh. And, you know, sometimes you felt they were just people coming to, you know, learn what they could, not not serious investors. But I was really curious. You, you mentioned these facilities have to be in secret locations. So do people who come visit get blindfolded or how does that work? We, we are always careful. So we also know the guys who we are showing the facilities. And if we would think th these are not the right people to show, then we don't do it. You know, we only, uh, there are a lot of people who want to see, but of course uh, we cannot do it for everyone. Uh, and we know the people that we show them um, that it's okay that they can see it. Um, of course, we it would be appreciated not to, now get the mobile out and and, and get their GPS uh, tracked their location exactly where it is and, and give out the coordinates. But uh, no one has that intention. The, most of the people are, yeah, serious and bigger investors that just want to clarify and just want to do their proper due, due diligence and uh, don't want to uh, come there with a bad intent or um, yeah, malicious intent. When you say investors, are they people investing in your company or investing in hash power as a cloud miner? Yeah, investing in hash power, of course, yes. Do you have many investors in the company itself? or We believe in our product. We are mining ourselves. We have a, a, a big fraction of our farm is running for us. We offer investments in hash power. So if someone is bigger and he wants to do an investment, we, we can talk uh, with them and, and find a suitable project to, to deliver the, as much hash, hash power uh, for the given money as possible. And um, we don't need to uh, yeah, sell equity or this is something that is yeah, not 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 so attractive for us. We we just we do what we can do best, and uh, investors want mostly want the hash power, and um, and that's what we provide. Say I was going to try for the first time to sign up on your website uh, for a cloud mining contract. I mean, I, I took a peek. I saw, obviously, as you can tell, I'm not an, <laughs> not an experienced Bitcoin miner. I, but I saw prices, and I wasn't even clear right off the bat. Was this a monthly price, or what are what are the prices I see on the different plans? The price is a one-time upfront payment, and besides that, you will not need to pay anything anymore uh, directly out of your pocket. Um, with a lifetime uh, contract, we have two uh, kinds of contracts. We have a lifetime one and we have a one-year uh, mining plan. From For both uh, plans, the maintenance, uh, meaning the electricity fee and, and everything that comes on top, uh, management and so on, um, is uh, subtracted from the mine coins every day. So it's a kind of fixed fee that is paid directly from the mine coins every day. And uh, but this is not something that you have to uh, pay uh, additionally, and you get charged uh, uh, or something. I mean, we of course sometimes those questions appear, but of course it's not the case. So you pay one time, and you mine all the time, and the maintenance fee uh, per day will be subtracted from the returns from the mine coins, and you will get the difference then paid out. What type of things should a user um, look at to try to guess? what their return on their investment's going to be. 
Well, it's it's very transparent and easy actually. Um, how much you can mine for one tera hash is something that you can calculate yourself, um, or you can estimate yourself, or you can also use one of the several dozens other profitability calculators that are around in the internet. Um, the most easy way, for example, to see how much um, how much one tera hash is returning each day. Uh, with uh, before uh, electricity fees are subtracted, you can, for example, go to Bitcoin Wisdom uh, slash Bitcoin slash difficulty, and um, you see, uh, yeah, I think most important data directly at the top there. You check the total hash power, and uh, it seems here when you read at the moment uh, we have around uh, yeah 408 petahash deployed to the network. So you just uh, take one tera hash and you know that 408 tera peta hashes are uh, returning at the moment per day on average about 3,600 bitcoins. So you can just calculate how much one tera hash is making out of that um, because you can calculate the percentage of how much do you, how much percent do you have from the network with one tera hash and then you can find out how much percentage of the total mine coins per day is uh, your tera hash making. And then you get the total mine coins for a terahash per day. And then you just subtract uh, the maintenance fee, which is uh, $1.50 for a terahash um, for mining with us. That's per day? That's per day, yes, exactly. And the difference is the number that you get paid out in Bitcoin. Just off the top of your head, if someone were to buy one Bitcoin or try to invest that amount of money in buying hashing power from you, what do you think at the end of the year the difference would be? Uh, I th if, if you ask the question, how much uh, does it cost to mine a single Bitcoin at current difficulty compared to how much does it cost to buy? If you have the state of the art hardware available at no cost and the best possible electricity prices, uh, you can probably mine uh, one Bitcoin for about $60. However, uh, this does not take into account hardware and setup costs and uh, work needed to, uh, to keep the operation going. Uh, factoring all of this in, uh, and one is able to, to mine uh, Bitcoin for about 20%, I think, uh, less than its current price. Uh, so we're talking about production costs uh, yeah, at the moment in the order of uh, yeah, 160 to $180. Uh, but it's just an estimation. It very much depends on the individual case. And uh, the three most important factors of that is the efficiency of the hardware uh, price uh, for elect electricity and the efficiency of the setup. And of course, uh, how much miners are additionally coming to the network? How is the difficulty um, behaving in the future? Uh, these are questions no one can answer. Yeah, I used to think difficulty always went up, but... Uh, no, it's not right. It's not always went up. Uh, of course, the tendency is there to go up. Um, if, uh, if the price is increasing. Um, but you can see, I mean, uh, when you go also on Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin wisdom, Bitcoin difficulty, uh, you can see the, the historical uh, difficulty increases. And you see that during this day, year, the increases were r rather low, 2%, 1%, and even went down, for example, in January 27th, it went down 6%. It went down on April 19 by 4%. And uh, this is something that never happened before. If you look at the, or if you compare it specifically to last year, where you had a difficulty increase for 20%, or it was not unusual that the difficulty is adjusting by 20% plus for a long time. It really exploded at that uh, point. But uh, this year was very favorable for all miners. And I can tell very um, uh, honestly, uh, if everybody who started mining now in the, by the beginning of this year um, is in a very favorable position. They, the, 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 the mining returns were uh, nearly constant over the year now, and the price was also stable in the range for 200 to $300. And they all have a, a lifetime or a one-year plan and uh, has some long term, long time to to continue mining. Back in April, you were talking about uh, just how many basically Ponzi schemes there were that were pretending to be mining operations. Do you feel that's it's 
the, some of those players have disappeared and it's, it's getting better? Or do you think there's just as much fraud going on? I think when I spoke in, in Los Angeles, I think it was an extreme case because there were really some major Ponzi schemes that by now, luckily, uh, have already stopped or uh, imploded, so to say. So they are not running anymore. Uh, of course, it's sad for the users because they lost the money. But uh, I think the situation improved a bit. Uh, but I think the most critical point is to educate users because uh, the Ponzi schemes, they will always come uh, as long as people are falling into this trap or don't know how to differentiate a valid operator from an illegal one. Uh, I think in our newest uh, move now with the life inside a Bitcoin mine, this is a perfect uh, example of uh, how we wanted to drive forward and set new milestones uh, for transparency in the cloud mining market. And I think we did a very good job. We provided basically a live stream, really live inside of one of our farms. It's a smaller one, but uh, still it's it's a big move, right? And I think no, no, no other cloud mining company or also other general miners don't show this. It seems like it's technically simple. Would there be a reason why people wouldn't do this? There are also valid reasons, of course. Um, that's also why we don't show our big, uh, our real large scale operations where most of our hash power is, is because of uh, things like the IP um, security reasons. And uh, yeah, these are the two most important things. Also, there are other points. We also do it. We show some uncritical uh, perspectives or we show some data centers where we feel comfortable um, showing. Uh, also, where we know that uh, the security is not uh, in danger. And uh, because, of course, for us, it's also most important. It's the miners that uh, of, of our users, right? So we uh, highest priority was always security has to maintain and and uh, also the IP cannot be in danger. So we managed it to, to still figure it out. Uh, and I'm sure that other providers uh, can do a lot more to increase their uh, transparency as well. But of course, uh, yeah, a anonymous pond, uh, anonymous cloud miner um, that doesn't have hardware in the back uh, will not do anything uh, tr uh, re regarding transparency. I know you have to go. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye? I want to thank everybody for uh, listening. Um, I... And uh, I just want to thank you, Rob. Uh, also, I just want to uh, tell everybody to, uh, to keep in touch also with the current discussion with uh, the block size debate uh, that you mentioned and that we discussed shortly. Uh, I think it's a big step for Bitcoin. We need to find a, a suitable consensus and uh, need to find a way how to go forward. It's critical for Bitcoin. And uh, I think it would be great if, if everybody is looking into this again and uh, making up their mind and participating actively in the community because this is critical. The community only lives if people are active and if nobody is acting anything and not, nobody's doing anything, the whole Bitcoin ecosystem is, uh, is suffering from that. And, uh, and that's why it's very important. And I just want to want to say that as a closing word. Marco, I did want to let you know, I mean, I've, I always felt very skeptical about cloud mining, but after meeting you in Los Angeles and talking to you, you seem you know, like a very straightforward, good guy. Um, I can't go so far as to recommend people, you know, try your business. I mean, just because I'm, it's not my, my, my job to tell people what to do with their money, but you seem like you're really, you know, a serious person who cares about Bitcoin and are offering a real service to people that's not a scam. It, as far as I can tell. <laughs> so <laughs> no, yeah. anyway, so thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. You are such a big force in Bitcoin with all your hash power. So it's I find that really exciting to, to get to talk to you. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks. Bitcoin. Thanks so much for listening to episode 25 of The Bitcoin Game. Follow me on Twitter at The BTC Game because I'll be asking some questions related to this episode. I'll be looking for the first to tweet the correct answer. The winners will receive their choice of either a Bitcoin keychain or a Bitcoin fork pin. If you go to bitcoinforks.com forward slash deal, you'll find a really good deal on a Bitcoin keychain plus a Bitcoin fork pin. You'll get both shipped anywhere in the US for just $12. This is a limited time offer, so don't miss it. And that's bitcoinforks.com 
forward slash deal. See you next time.